Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a new survey looks at affordable art spaces in Mesa. Also tonight, we'll learn about new body scan technology to help detect skin diseases. And we will hear about the Phoenix Symphony's upcoming season. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A new survey looks at the demand and availability of affordable art spaces in Mesa. Here to discuss the survey is Cindy Ornstein, Executive Director of the Mesa Art Center and Director of the Mesa Arts and Culture Department. Also joining us is Mesa City Councilwoman Terry Benelli. Good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Thank Good. you for having us. Uh, the Mesa Art Space Project, what are we talking about? We're talking about a collaboration of several MESA organizations with the city and most importantly with ArtSpace, which is a nonprofit out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that has developed spaces for creative businesses and artists across the country, but they've never done one in Arizona. And this is, a, again, a look for affordable art spaces, not only for artists, but for businesses, correct? It sure is. Um, the, the project would potentially consist of 50 to 60 um, apartments for artists um, that would basically have a rent cap so that the um, apartments would be affordable for about 15 years. Um, the bottom floor of the project, because it would likely be a multi-story project, um, would be for creative businesses. That's interesting. Now, again, this is, it sounds a little bit public, a little bit private here. Mm -hmm. How, what's the dynamic there? Well, it, it, ArtSpace is a nonprofit, and the, in the pre-development phase, w the City of Mesa is a partner in trying to make sure we have everything, all our ducks in a row, to be able to do this project. After that, um, it is managed, it is constructed, managed, and run by the ArtSpace organization, so it's a private nonprofit organization that's running it. But there is, uh, there are things like tax credits, et cetera, that play into okay. making it an affordable uh, project and these are not just living spaces for artists they're live work spaces so there's studio spaces in them as well well let's talk about this survey now what, what did the survey exactly look at so the survey um, looked at the interest in artists that would ha that we would have coming to Mesa to live in the project it also looked for creative art businesses and art organizations to see if they would be interested in uh, renting space inside the um, the project and what did you find well, overwhelming response. Uh, over 600 um, artists that were interested in moving to Mesa and living in the project, and over 100 art organizations that um, were interested in the project and said that they would um, love to have more information going forward. That kind of response surprise you at all? Well, we were expecting a good response, but we're really pleased that it was um, many multiples of the amount that were necessary to make a, to give a green light to the project. So we're we're really happy that we got um, the response we did, and not just from artists in Mesa. We we surveyed across the valley, and it was collaborative. We worked with many other cities in the valley to make sure that we could gather information that was valley wide, and we're sharing the results with those cities. So we hope lots of similar projects will pop up across the valley. Demand for art space. Let's let's go to downtown Mesa, where things are. If they're not happening right now, they're going to be happening soon with light rail. Right. Demand for art space down there. What are you finding out? Well, we're finding out that people are excited about what's happening in Mesa. They're interested in being near the art center. They're interested in being in a community of artists. And I think a lot of people do feel that there's a quite a buzz about Mesa as a place for creativity and innovation and so um, we're, we're really gratified they want to come be part of that community. How, from the council's point of view how do you take that buzz if it's out there and say uh, we got something going on here in downtown Mesa. Again with a survey like this how does a politician and public, poli you know, public policy mm -hmm. folks how do you put that in practice? You know, I, I think our goal is just to make this happen and make it be the smoothest process possible for the developer. We know that the community is uh, values the arts in Mesa. It's our art and cultural district for the city, and um, we just want to tap into that excitement. As far as design elements, as far as building features, what did the survey tell you? Well, we know that there are certain things that artists want. Um, I think the biggest thing was people wanted natural light. Um, I believe they wanted high ceilings and open space that they could design for themselves. I'm trying to remember a couple of the, they, they, a couple of the other requirements. You know, one of the wanted. other things that they look at is the size spaces that they need 
Um, many of the projects have studio apartments all the way up to three bedroom apartments. And I think the returns that we got were more for single or uh, maybe two people living in the apartments more so than families. But that changes as yeah. artists, you know, grow up and have families. And artists can stay in these projects for, you know, for their entire life. So they could move in in a studio and move up to a three bedroom with children and then move back down if they're still income qualified. Interesting. Now, how was this particular survey conducted? So it was online and it was also um, done in person. Um, Neighborhood Economic Development Corporation had um, one person that that was kind of their job for two months was to go out, um, go to art events, go to art organizations, go to classes at ASU. Um, anywhere where there was a gathering of artists they were, we were at um, getting information from the survey. NEDCO also does an art entrepreneur program and um, we had help from those art entrepreneurs that we had trained over the years um, to help with the, the art scene in Mesa. I remembered something else that people said they wanted that I think is important. They wanted commu shared community space, shared gallery space. Mm -hmm. And that is the feature of most art space projects. The artists really enjoy being part of a community of artists and being able to have an impact on the community. So things like open studio tours and community mm -hmm. galleries. And in fact, it's very common for coffee shops to pop up in these oh, sure. developments. Oh, sure. Um, now, has this kind of survey been conducted before in Mesa, in Arizona? And if so, how does this compare to the results? No, it has not been done in Arizona before, but it is the same survey that, that Artspace has used in many other communities. And they usually, um, they have a, a requirement for three to one redundancy, meaning of whatever number they think they need for the project, they have to have at least three times oh. that number saying that they're interested and they got, they exceeded that. So um, that went beautifully and apparently is, is better than it's been in some other markets. From a public policy, and again, from, from the council standpoint, you got business interests, you want to make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck in terms of property, especially downtown Mesa mm -hmm. with all the investment of light rail. Um, are, are, is everyone on board with this or are some folks saying it's nice to have nonprofits down there with artists, but we need businesses, we need some kind of more firm or more traditional kind of a business? You know what, Ted, I have to tell you, the first time that I met the um, administrators from ArtSpace when they were here doing a pre-feasibility study, I had a, a business meeting with the, with the businesses along Main Street and they had just come from visiting the mayor and council and they said the first time in their history that they had walked into a room and everybody was on the same page. Um, the council and the mayor all had seen art space projects across the country and they were ready to go, so full support. And, and I think it's important to mention that art space projects typically bring a lot of other businesses into the areas where they develop. And in addition, they don't just serve nonprofits. They have creative businesses like videographers and graphic mm -hmm. design firms that actually um, work in their spaces. So you're bringing additional businesses into the community as well. Real quickly, last question. Where do we go from here? We hire architects and we go for um, LIHTC tax, credit pro uh, tax credits next April. And all we're right. working to raise the money to yes. do all that pre-development work, the design and everything. All right. Well, congratulations. It sounds like things are happening there in downtown Mesa, all are. over Mesa, I guess. <laughs> and I'm sure artists are uh, very pleased to hear what you both discussed tonight. Good to have you here. Thanks for Thanks, Ted. Thank you for having us.
Thermospector is a Tucson company behind new technology that provides a full body scan of a person's skin, allowing doctors to track changes over time to detect skin diseases. Carlene Siebold is the co-founder and CEO of Thermospector, and Dr. Clara Curiel is the company's co-founder and chief medical officer. It is Thermospector, correct? Did I get that right? Okay, good, that because right. yes. this medical stuff can throw me sometimes. <laughs> a full body scan of your skin. Explain, please. Well, our, we have imaging technology that does high resolution standardized imaging of your skin in order for physicians to track changes over time. So the idea is to have um, accessible, affordable imaging that could be part of your medical record. And now are these, is this the kind of imaging, is it like an MRI, like a CAT scan, like a photo, what, what kind of imaging? No, it's, it's digital imaging, high resolution digital imaging, but very standardized and um, done in a way that can be compared um, as you uh, collect these images over time. And we're seeing this guy here, this is an animation now, this guy getting, is this basically what happens? You go in and uh, you're not necessarily looking for something, you're just looking for anything? Anything, because if you think about it, when you go and see your physician, whether it's your primary care or your dermatologist, when you go in right now, they look at your skin, and what do they do next? They actually write down what they're looking at. They don't have an image to use as a documentation. So when you start accumulating this number of images over time, you have then the flexibility of going back and compare what the patient has on that day to what they had before, whether it's a mole, a rash, but specifically what is really important is looking for the detection of skin cancer at early stages. Indeed, you're looking for changes, aren't changes. you? Changes, something that is new or something that it was there before but is now different. And it's very hard to keep track of these lesions over time. And, and, and uh, it sounds like, uh, from what I was reading, the, there are multiple images that are kind of mm -hmm. stitched together. Is that how it works as well? Mm -hmm. That's correct. We have Right now we have nine poses to cover 85% of the body area. And we have nine cameras that collect those images and we put them together to use as a navigation technique so you see a full body image and when you're looking at the image. And when you see the image and you say, oh, uh, something looks a little bit different here, or you're saying, mm -hmm. oh, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a change, do you, how is it marked? And how do you know what to look for next time? We have a specific application that we developed to go along with this. So we have a server database so those images are stored securely. And then the, we developed a very efficient viewing application for the physician. So it's like an iPad application that you can go on and you can annotate those images and then they can be saved back to the server. I was going to ask, how mm -hmm. much training is needed by physicians to use the equipment for their patients? Not very much. It's almost like grabbing your iPhone, your iPad. If you think about it, for the physician, it's a very busy day. They go back to back, 10 minutes per patient. So you can't possibly slow them down. So if anything, it's increasing accuracy in the documentation, but they're navigating in a very intuitive way right. through the images. So they just click on a mole, put a circle around the mole. What do I do next? I biopsy the mole, and then you know I'm going to follow this patient in X number of weeks. But it's all done one after the other. You don't really have to spend too much time annotating in the standard medical record. And if you see something or and it hasn't changed, or if you see something and you know it's not a problem, um, again, there, there, there's data storage mm -hmm. to say, not a problem, but just mm -hmm. keep an eye on this thing. And you can market to and say, I'm not worried, reassure, right. and then you move on. So it's Not just for skin cancer though, right? Are there, mm -hmm. are there other skin diseases that this can track? Yes, I mean, it's really for anything, anything that, that appears on your skin. And the way, how we view it is, it's more as a, an image-centric documentation. So instead of taking handwritten notes, I can take high-resolution imaging of you, and I can store that in my records. And next year when you come in, I can continue to track what's happening in your skin. Indeed. And so any, anything from what, the psoriasis to, exactly. as you mentioned, rash, the whole yeah, line of psoriasis, rash. And there are other applications that are very interesting. For example, telemedicine. Oh, right yes. Now. Teledermatology. Some patients are now being seen remotely. So this way you can acquire images in a faraway place. And because it's comprehensive, it's total body, they can be you know, diagnosed, assessed in a, another center, and then provide the feedback. The other application for clinical trials, you know, for when you're doing drug development, you need very standardized documentation. Sure. And we're actually participating now oh, with drug trials for proper objective. To make sure there isn't a rash breaking out because of a particular yeah. drug. That's, that's very interesting. How did this get started? How did you, you guys are co-founders here. So how did this get started? We, we met on an airplane, believe it or not, a long time ago. I'm an engineer by training and I was working in a lot of scene matching technology 
and Clara was running a pigmented lesion clinic yeah. and talking about her, her struggles with trying to compare images over time. So we originally started in change detection. And after some years of working on that, and we got a Science Foundation Arizona grant, they were a big supporter of this technology, um, we really realized that um, we can work on change detection, but you really need that to really move imaging. People, you have to have a, a database of images in order to do change detection. Did you have challenges in the early going? Yes, and the challenges was exactly what we're trying to solve today, which is adoption of imaging. We have uh, made a huge progress in change detection. That's the easy part. But you need to have images that are standardized at two point in time so you can put them together. And the system, that's what we're envisioning, that's where we're going, is mm -hmm. to automate change detection. So we will be a help and an aid to the physician this area change by this rate over this period of time. So it will be even more objective than when it is now. So what are you getting as far as a reaction now from the medical community? It is interesting because Every, it makes sense to everyone, but when you're not used to it, yes. it's that paradigm. It's mm -hmm. that we need to shift the way how we practice, like radiology at the time of fluoroscopy. They didn't have hard films. They just look at the x-ray, what was projecting, and then documented it. Right. But now radiology can live without hard films. That's, that's the way of practice. So and that's what we're moving into. That's what we really see in the future is becoming image-centric documentation, the new way of practicing. And, and last question. And, and last question. How do you get into that future? What, what's what's the next step here? So we're in our, we're doing our beta testing here in the Phoenix area at the Scottsdale Healthcare Center is one of our sites. We're continuing to deploy um, beta testing, getting feedback from both physicians and patients. And so far, the patient response is overwhelmingly positive. They love it. They have very high confidence in having imaging taken and stored. Well, so we're continuing our, our beta testing, and then we're moving into manufacturing here in Arizona. Well, very good. That confidence is important. Good to have you both here. Congratulations you on your us. success. Well, thank you. Thank you. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at the Phoenix Symphony's new season, which features, among other things, a new music director. Joining me now is Phoenix Symphony President and CEO, Jim Ward. Good to see you again. Good, Ted. Good to see you. How are things with the symphony? The symphony's doing really very well, and uh, we're finishing up a blockbuster season this season and looking forward to an even better season next season. The first time we talked, the first time you took over, the season wasn't doing all that well, and, and it sounds like things have improved. Is that true? Absolutely. Just on the business side, when, when I came aboard about three and a half years ago, yeah, the symphony was not doing very well. Uh, there was a structural deficit in debt, uh, but due to some great work uh, from our musicians who who sacrificed uh, uh, some salary restoration and uh, a great staff and a great board and community. Uh, we have uh, paid off all of our debt. We've uh, managed to balance our budget and we're, we're looking great as we move forward. I was going to ask, what is the relationship now with musicians and contracts and salaries, the whole nine yards? Well, listen, our musicians a number of years ago took a 19% cut in their pay, the largest of any American orchestra up until that time, and they sacrificed the restoration of that salary to give us enough time to be able to to stabilize the symphony, and we now have gotten them back on a path towards that. Uh, not completely there, uh, but I believe if you were to ask them, uh, they would uh, express great confidence in the direction of the symphony and uh, uh, very uh, good morale overall, and so uh, we have a great relationship. There's a new uh, direction as far as music is concerned, the new music director, uh, Tito Munoz. Who is Tito Munoz? Tito Munoz is, uh, 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 a ball of fire is who Tito Munoz is. Uh, 
Tito uh, grew up in, in Queens, New York, and rode a subway train every day over to the, the Fame School, the LaGuardia School. And then he went to Juilliard uh, Prep and then debuted with the National Symphony Orchestra. He uh, then went to Aspen and the summer festivals and won all of the music director awards. He was an assistant conductor at the Cincinnati Orchestra and then a resident conductor at the famed Cleveland Orchestra, arguably the best in the world. Oh, yeah. Went on to be a music director at Orchestre Nancy in France and now he's coming to, to Phoenix. All in the span of a number of years and he's about 30 years old. So he's, uh, he's done a lot in his uh, time frame. What does he bring to the Phoenix Symphony? Well, he brings three things, Ted, that we were very uh, 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 focused on in terms of our selection. First of all, he brings chemistry and inspiration with our musicians, and that's critical to having the sound uh, be produced at the level that it needs to be produced. So that's the first thing. Secondly, he brings a commitment to our overall vision and mission of helping to educate the next generation of a creative workforce here in Arizona. And Tito is very committed to education and our community outreach programs. And that was extremely important to us at all as well. And then the third thing that he brings to us is because of his uh, uh, both wisdom and youth at the same time, uh, he brings to us the capability of, of trying to determine what the next generation of a symphony is, what the 21st century symphony looks like, what a symphony 2.0 might be, and how that might appeal to a younger audience of which he's a member. What does symphony 2.0 look like? Well, Ted, there are, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, we've, we've observed uh, over the course of time with uh, a younger audience. Of course, it has uh, developed uh, with potentially a shorter attention span, digesting media in shorter uh, chunks. Uh, a younger generation also digests music and visuals at the same time. And so uh, that suggests different programming uh, options for us, incorporating audiovisual uh, elements, uh, having different length concerts, uh, incorporating social elements, both literally socially with other people, but also uh, social media as well. So there's a whole new horizon of things that we could uh, uh, potentially do with the Phoenix Symphony, and that's something that Tito brings as well. And I want to talk about the next season here and the schedule and what you have planned there. But back to Tito real quickly. You mentioned chemistry, how important that was. Yes. Do you, I mean, do you audition these guys in front of the orchestra and just, do you watch their body language? Do you get their input? Do you want to hear what the oboe section has to say about the new all, guy? All of the above. Uh, Tito, uh, you know, we spent two and a half years uh, identifying who our next music director would be. Um, and the orchestra members are e extremely involved, both uh, from a committee perspective, but then after every candidate comes in, we do a quantitative study with the orchestra who gives us their input, and then qualitatively we sit down with them as well. Uh, Tito actually came in twice, and, uh, and you also sit in the audience and hear the sound and see how the, the audience reacts, and you see that interaction, and there are many, many variables uh, that, that, that go into this, but absolutely the musicians yeah. are involved. And now let's talk about, we mentioned Symphony 2.0 and how you need to kind of change things a little bit. I noticed next season you've got everything from the music of Queen, which you better pay Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> in that one. Uh, um, and Led Zeppelin and Neil Diamond to Dvorak's Ninth, which I love the Largo movement. It's about the only thing I can say with knowledge that I know about classical oh, music. Good. I mean, talk about this next season. And again, with a new music director, what changes? Well, uh, Tito was involved in the development of our next season as well as our musicians. Uh, and we have a, a great, great season. It's going to kick off with opening night. It's Tito's first uh, uh, entree to, to Phoenix and he's going to be conducting Stravinsky's Firebird Suite which is a personal favorite of his but then uh, Karl Orff's Carmina Burana which everybody knows because it's used as a music track to every trailer and TV commercial <laughs> known to mankind but it's actually an amazing work we're gonna have our symphony uh, 140 members of the Phoenix Choir and the Phoenix Boys Choir all on stage at the same time so it's gonna be a magnificent uh, jump off to the season but we have an amazing classic season program and and, and pops as well, and it is uh, diverse from uh, a new, brand new legend series where we're bringing in, uh, in effect, cover bands to cover the music of Led Zeppelin and Queen and, and the number one cover band for Neil Diamond, uh, Super Diamond, but to play with the symphony orchestra, and that's great. We're also going to be projecting uh, for the first time here in Phoenix uh, the, the great movie Singing in the Rain, and we're going to be playing the score live while you're watching that movie, so that's great. We're also doing a unique collaboration, believe it or not, with 
Phoenix International Raceway, who's celebrating their 50th anniversary, and also Barrett Jackson. And uh, we're going to be doing a whole uh, benefit uh, where we're going to shut down streets in front of Symphony Hall, create pit row, bring cars in, <laughs> and then have everybody go on inside for a concert called The Speed of Sound. And we're going to celebrate racing and cars with music and movie clips and all sorts of fun activities. So. Well, before you go, we only got about 30 seconds left. The, the longtime subscription holders here, are, 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 how are they handling all this stuff? Oh, they're handling it well. In fact, uh, you know, the normal churn or, or degradation of subscriptions in the industry is 12 to 15 percent. Uh, we're holding steady, and in fact, because of Tito Munoz, we're actually increasing subscribers this year. So they're very excited about it. In addition to the fact that we're up 20 percent in single ticket sales as My well. My goodness. Yeah. Well, it sounds like things are happening, and it sounds like an exciting program. It's good to see you again. Thanks Thank for you, joining Tom. us. Okay. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, it's time again for Southern Exposure, our regular look at issues from Southern Arizona. And we'll learn of how a major medical donation to St. Joseph's Hospital will have a statewide impact. That's tomorrow, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.